folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and now we get to the final chapter in the Back to the Future trilogy with Back to the Future Part 3, which stars Michael J. Fox, Christopher Lloyd, Mary Steen Burgeon, Thomas F. Wilson, Leah Thompson, James Tolkien, Patrick Butram, Harry Carey Jr., Doug Taylor, Elizabeth Shue, Jeffrey Wiseman, and Flea. It's written by Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis, and it's directed by Robert Zemeckis. The movie begins set on November 12, 1955, where we all left off from the sequel, which actually has the archive footage to the original Back to the Future. Marty McFly, who's played by Michael J. Fox, had discovered that Dr. Ember Brown, or simply Doc Brown, who's played by Christopher Lloyd, has been trapped in 1885 once he receives the seven-year-old letter from him that was given by a courier at Western Union, who, of course, played by Paul Fragerty. Marty decided to use uh, Doc from 1955, just as uh, Doc decided to send Marty from 1985, of course, was all the way straight back to the future. So that's where uh, Doc reveals that he was from the future. So that way, you know, he can actually help Doc use him to um, to take him straight with the DeLorean to go back to 1885. So unfortunately, since uh, Doc was already shocked that that he came back, he fainted and and then he was taken all the way straight to his home which on that stormy morning yeah, <laughs> Doc was awake only to find out what was happening and then yeah, still already shocked about that Marty came back and everything yeah, he also brought in his hoverboard along and and all of that and of course you, you see a different dog this time around I mean, before Einstein so Marty and Doc decided to use the information in Doc's letter by trying to locate and repair the DeLorean by using all these uh, new tires and everything. He then spots the tombstone with Doc's name on it which is dated six days after the letter has been sent only to find out that he was being killed by Biff Tannen's great-grandfather Buford Mad Dog Tannen the meanest guy on the west and yeah, just like all the other western villains that we get yeah, and he's played by Thomas L. Wilson, of course. With that aside, because they started spotting all the information at the library, all these pictures hanging around, even the shot of a doc um, hanging with the, the clock that were ready to be set on the, <laughs> on the new Hill Valley Courthouse, which I know that's what we saw. And then we, we spotted uh, Buford Mad Dog Tannen's picture on there. Marty decided to actually travel back to 1885 with the DeLorean at the Ponchi Drive-In Theater, you know, with Doc around. So he went straight into the, the drive-in screen where we saw the, the bottom where they actually have all the Indians around. And once up arriving inside September 2nd, 1885, right in the middle of the United States Cavalry between the Cowboys and the Indians. So within his pursuit, one of the uh, Indian's arrows suddenly got shot into the DeLorean's fuel line and it's been torn completely forcing Marty to hide the car inside the bear cave yeah that's where he spotted that bear he ran and and walked and then he fell in and got knocked unconscious into the fence where then he spotted his Irish born great grandson Seamus who was also played by Michael J. Fox, and, and then of course uh, Maggie McFly, who's played by Leah Thompson. Uh, which that's where he started to talk about some conversation about what's going on, you know, during dinner. And I know he was eating that food, which actually has all these pellets that came right into his mouth because the guy just shot him. Marty did spotted uh, the firstborn child, who happens to be the first uh, baby born in America. <laughs> And I know there was that scene where when Marty actually picked up the child, he actually says, So you're the first baby born in America, and you peed on me. 
<laughs> oh man, that was funny. So then Marty decided to walk all the way straight to Hill Valley where the whole entire town is simply a western town now. Yeah, you see all the places all the way uh, set that's just like any other western town that you saw. So that was a perfect location to know what Hill Valley looks like. And yeah, you can even see the, the Hill Valley courthouse already being ready to be built. So they're already planning on doing that. You can even see the clock that you saw. So that was really cool. So then he wants up straight into the saloon just to have ice water. And then all of a sudden he spotted Buford and his gang. Yeah. Yeah, with Marty already dressed up as a cowboy and everything. <laughs> Since the, you know, before he arrived here. Suddenly he reveals his secret name, which I know that's the name of the actor and director named Clint Eastwood. <laughs> yeah, Buford decided to use his gun and started shooting him by telling him to dance, and that's where he was started to do all these dance moves. <laughs> yeah, from Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah, he's doing the moonwalk and, and the spins and everything. Then he was being chased by them until all of a sudden he's been you know, he's been hanging into the rope from Buford and swinging them all the way around Hill Valley and then he tied them up up to um, the courthouse until Doc shows up with a telescopic gun that he has and shoots the the rope which already been hanging uh, Marty around yeah just just to save him and already ready to actually um, planning on shooting Buford so then they all escape and already playing on on actually going on a showdown between him and Doc, of course. So then when Doc finally spotted Marty, they wound up um, agreeing to leave 1885, but because the DeLorean was running out of gas, they were unable to accelerate the time machine to go straight up to 88 miles per hour. So Doc decided to devise a scheme to actually use a black locomotive, or at this rate a train, to push the DeLorean up to speed at that particular amount since they couldn't use the wagon to help go up to that speed. So then Doc and Marty explored a rare spiral as they intended to use a spot which they actually used to actually spot the, the scene where you know they were going to set the, the locomotive into the ravine the, which is known as the Sinash Ravine until they spotted an out of control horse drawn wagon only to find out that that the passenger inside was a teacher named Clara Clayton, who's played by Mary Steenburgen. So Doc winds up saving her by by falling into the ravine, and then <laughs> and the two decided to fall in love with each other. It actually happened all this time once they tried to uh, set up a model by using the the train and the time machine connected together to go all the way straight by 88 miles per hour into the ravine so, so that's where it'll go <laughs> so anyway Doc started to fall in love with Clara and they've been talking and you know, they started to fix the the telescope that, that she has and he says when you turn to this knob it's all fuzzy but if you turn to the other knob everything becomes clear <laughs> Yeah, that scene. So they're already being ready to go to a town festival. Yeah, which that's the scene where Marty was trying out that gun by shooting all these uh, targets. Yeah, it, it was basically uh, a shooting game that, that they came up with, you know, where they had to shoot all these uh, bad guys as targets. <laughs> and I know the guy actually says, What do you learn to shoot like that? And he says, 7 Eleven. <laughs> Buford and his gang shows up at the town center, where we then also spotted another great grandfather named Strickland. Yeah, he's played once again by James Tolkien. Yeah, because he does look exactly like the Strickland that we know, who's the principal. But this is basically a great great grandfather of him. But he also has it along with his kid. So just to stop the game, because they're about to ready to shoot. Um, Doc, um, right in the middle of it, you know, and then Marty actually saves Doc 
by using the frisbee pies he spins it around and and knock uh, Buford's gun away and then and it actually shots uh, Doc's hat as it blew up and then and he's just telling him to lighten up jerk so then suddenly they arranged the, the showdown by having uh, Buford actually calling him a yellow belly sort of like yeah which is basically chicken which it means and then <laughs> so they decided to create it a showdown now with Marty and Buford yeah which is going to be set on Monday at the same time that you know, Doc was going to be killed which didn't happen this time around so that's when we spotted the, the picture that he took with the, the tombstone are revealing his name but it was yet to disappear so now it's going to replace his name in there under the name Clint Eastwood so yeah he's saying great Scott and, and Doc says I know this is heavy <laughs> but of course you know Doc and Clara were spending more time together you know they were talking about a book by Julius Byrne yeah since you know they started reading a lot of that yeah, I, I know Doc got into it and everything. Yeah, because they, they really had some good chemistry together. No doubt about it. Unfortunately, since, you know, he's already ready to be set up to go to um, travel way back to 1985, which I know this is where we lead to the unbelievable truth, which I really, really did not like. I, I didn't like this scene. Because I know Doc didn't want to leave. And, yeah, that's true, because he didn't want to. But, you know, suddenly, uh, you know, Marty becomes the voice of reason. You know, kind of like what, what Doc was the voice of reason for Marty. Since he couldn't do all this. But that's true, because he had to go back to his timeline. So that wouldn't help. So anyway, they try to get everything all ready to set this up by having to use the, the DeLorean to hook up into the black train. Doc decided that he was just going to go up to Clara at her house and tell her that he can't bring her along and, and he was ready to leave because that's where he reveals the truth that which I know Clara actually told him that yeah, is where he's a time traveler and a scientist and he was about to leave on the time machine back to 1985 so he could send Marty over there that's where she got so mad at him that he slapped him in the face. Yes, and that's the main reason why I hate the unbelievable truth. Because this is a scene where when you have one person who reveals their true identity, especially when that other person had told them to tell the truth, that's where they, they started getting mad. And I know, they started crying after that too. The person who reveals the true identity wants to doing some stupid things after that. He even leaves. I hate that, that stupid cliche. They've been using that in many movies already. And I wish that cliche just fucking die already. You know, why can't he just make a, a much better unbelievable truth cliche by actually trying to reveal the truth and have them understand that all of this is just part of the whole idea because they knew this was going to happen later on. So that's where it did actually happen because once Doc started feeling very heartbroken after what happened, he decided to go all the way straight to the saloon where he was planning on drinking that whiskey. He was going to drink the whole entire bottle, but he spent the whole time just just talking to the the game, you know, about you know the the future and how everything's going to lie on it and everything. He spends the whole entire morning talking about that. And, until Marty showed up into the saloon and and they're about to ready to leave only to find out that once he drank the the whiskey because it was only one he actually fainted <laughs> so then the bartender along with the rest of the game decided to create their own wake-up juice for Doc so that way he can be awakened only to soon find out that once uh, 8 o'clock is almost arriving Buford and his gang already showed up on, on time, or at this rate, really early, just ready to actually duel with Marty. The only problem is, is that Doc is already unconscious, 
from the wake up juice that he's been drinking because <laughs> he drank all that water <laughs> that, that actually happened. So at this rate, he was basically given some minutes already, which I know he called, he actually says, he's an asshole. I don't care what Buford says, and I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> yeah, because he was already counting him to leave out of there. So anyway, Doc uh, and Marty went back on the back door, and all of a sudden uh, he spotted uh, one of Buford's gains, and ready to shoot him and then Marty wants up straight into the to where the furnace is that's where he spotted that part that's been shot out and decided to use that that part as a build a poop press so it could be all set up and that's what it did too because once Marty came along and and ready to duel with uh, Buford yeah he got shot but then when he got up <laughs> he went he just got up and he was ready to actually actually punched Buford, yeah, once Buford actually punched his uh, chest, only to find out that, <laughs> that it, there was a metal plate on there as it hurt his hand. Yeah, and then <laughs> he took that out and he started punching him all the way straight into the, the tombstone. Yeah, he kept on punching him a lot. Yes, and after that, he actually punches him all the way straight into, you're going to get this, the manure. Yeah, just like the last two films, it's always the manure. <laughs> oh, man, that, that was so funny. And that's where he says, I hate manure. So Buford got arrested now. And, and now uh, Doc and Marty are on their way to go straight into the DeLorean that's already been set on the train tracks. But, of course, they had to use the, the locomotive by uh, actually disguise themselves at gunpoint straight to the train conductors by actually using it as a science experiment yeah <laughs> so then Clara already on the train to San Francisco only to find out that he overhears the salesman at the saloon that Doc Brown was actually over there how they're talking about what was happening and what was going on until, until Clara found out that it was Doc in the saloon and so she decided to use the emergency brake to escape from the train and was ready to leave to find uh, Doc and Marty but unfortunately they already left at this point so then um, <laughs> already with Doc and Marty borrowing the, the locomotive they, they changed the train tracks all the way straight to where the DeLorean is already set and they're ready to move by using all these free bearings that they had with the uh, red, yellow, and green, you know, all set up like like this, so that way they're ready to go. So they put into the the train as it moves. Then suddenly, Claire sh suddenly to show up, just right in the mid middle of this, and once they're trying to go all the way straight to 88 miles per hour, yeah, Claire actually hang on to the back of the train, which then suddenly. Doc actually spotted uh, Clara already hanging on and you know, trying to help her out of there. Yeah, which that's where it leads to bigger trouble because because it was ready to explode once it hits to that particular um, mile. So then Marty decided to use the um, already you know calling uh, Doc out by going straight to those uh, miles per hours that they're going for um, and already exploding already. And you know, Marty decided to use the hoverboard to go straight into uh, the dock so that way he can hang on with Clara just to get out of the train while f flying and floating around while Marty is just going all the way straight into the ravine where, and once he already disappears with the DeLorean that's shooting up straight into it <laughs> yeah the train actually fell into the ravine and explodes that's when he finally got back to 1985 where we now spotted the ravine already being built and I know it says Eastwood Ravine <laughs> he winds up in Hilldale which actually turns out to be a suburban town you know, he's already been set until suddenly and this is one of the saddest moments in the movie was when all of a sudden the train arrives and actually destroys the DeLorean which 
That's what Doc said in the movie since he alternated the time, since he saved Clara from, from the ravine. Is when Marty says, Well, it's destroyed just the way you wanted it. Yeah. I didn't want that to happen. Yeah, because he's already dressed up um, as a cowboy and everything. He finally went back to um, to Lyons' estate where he went back to his house. Uh, already spotted Biff and yeah, with the Toyota 4x4 pickup truck. And then he spotted all the rest of the family. <laughs> already back to normal. <laughs> yeah, we even got to see uh, the last of Wendy Jo Sperber in the film. Yeah, before her passing in 2005, only to find out that she was pregnant in, in this movie. <laughs> yeah, because I know she was going to do that new show later on. So anyway, everything was back to normal, but then he just went back to go find Jennifer, who's already in the porch. So then they decided to go on the ride on the Toyota 4x4 truck, where then he spotted uh, needles, you know, already ready to, to do a drag race between him and and Marty, which he didn't, thank goodness, because he, he actually uh, drove all the way back. <laughs> so I know that's when he spotted what just happened because he almost about to hit the, the wall voice, almost. So then that's when uh, Jennifer actually spotted the, the paper that says you're fired and it disappears. So then when they went back to the, uh, the train site, where that's where the DeLorean got destroyed. He never expected this to happen, but all of a sudden the train actually shows up out of nowhere. <laughs> and it turns out Marty and Clara had just came back by a modified uh, train that he just built, using it as a time machine, yeah, just like the DeLorean. So then that's where Doc actually reveals uh, what was happening. And now yeah, Doc and Clara now has children. Yeah, both named after the offer, Jules and Byrne. And yes, that's where Byrne, of course, his name, was the creepy kid that I saw in the movie. Because that's where we get to that scene where after Jennifer decided to talk to uh, Doc about the paper that she receives that says you're fired and it's been a race, yeah, Doc explains to her that the main reason why it's a race is because it hasn't been written yet. And that's when, in the background, right next to Doc, he spotted the burn already actually doing those commands where he did his hand gestures like this, and he points it in his crouch. I'm like, wow, I cannot believe they actually shot that scene, but I know that's probably because the actor who played him wanted to go to the bathroom, and that shows. <laughs> Yeah, you can even tell he's he's feeling uh, like he really wanted to go. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame him. But that scene creeped me out as a kid when I saw this, and I couldn't believe it myself. <laughs> so anyway, Doc and Clara decided to leave while you know going to their <laughs> next adventure, or what seems to be. And I know Marty says, Where are you going, Doc? Back to the future? And Doc says, Nope already been there <laughs> and then the train decided to fly all the way up into the sky and it went straight into the screen and then the movie ends <laughs> just like that yep and wow definitely the perfect ending to the back to the future trilogy that i ever saw and i really love this movie so much i think it was a lot better than than the sequel that it turned out to be. In fact, this was a perfect ending for it. Um, it. It had everything that they were going for. I liked the fact that it was all set in a western town. So it's sort of like a tribute to all these westerns that we've seen. You know, I like how they show all the cowboys and and everybody around town so you see how a western should definitely be like. <laughs> so Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale really did a good job doing this on set. Seeing that they shot this movie back to back with the sequel. It took them 11 months to, to shoot this all the way. This time, it, instead of just uh, Doc uh, focusing on Marty's uh, future, you know, having to save his parents and having to deal with everything that's happening, 
Now it's focusing more on Doc, you know, falling in love with Clara since he saved her life. And yeah, and I gotta say, they both had good chemistry together, you know, Christopher Lloyd and Mary Steenburgen. Considering the fact that Christopher Lloyd had been in a film with Mary Steenburgen before, um, not to mention Mary Steenburgen had been in a time traveling film before this called Time After Time. So yeah, she was beautiful back then. It's hard to believe that this is sort of a deja vu <laughs> type of thing for her to actually arrive in another. Uh, time traveling franchise that's back to the future <laughs> yeah and she really enjoyed this movie because the main reason why she was chosen because of her, of her kids since her kids really love the back to the future movies <laughs> I gotta say is <laughs> she was lucky <laughs> she really was and I agree she was the right choice for, for this movie and Thomas Self Wilson who did a great job once again playing the villain only this time it's a, it's a powerful western villain named Mad Dog Tannen. Yeah, Buford, which is his real name. <laughs> and that's where he says the line, Nobody calls me Mad Dog. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, after him playing the bully in the original Back to the Future, yeah, as well as the sequel too, even playing his older self and all that. And even his uh, other grandson, Griff, in the futuristic 2015. I mean, he, he pretty much plays the bully every single movie out there. No matter what. Because, <laughs> you know, in real life, you know, Thomas L. Wilson's a great guy. He's never that mean. Well, yeah, the movie had everything that they were going for. Once again, some good special effects by ILM, yeah, Industrial Light and Magic. Yeah, once again with the sparks and and the tire tracks and flames already, you know, shooting and disappearing with the DeLorean, and they go back to to where they are. <laughs> yeah, especially that needs special effects on the train, the modified train at the end of the movie. So it was really cool. But they still use those special effects. But everything's just quiet. It's like the perfect western town that they use for the film. Just an interesting story. You know, it had a good love story. Um, better paced. You know, we get to see what a different side of uh, Doc Brown. As well as a different side of Marty. And, yeah, we get to see all of that in, in this movie. And we even get to see some um, actors, including uh, Pat Boutram, along with Harry Carey Jr. and Dub Taylor in this movie. I mean, it was great to see uh, Pat Boutram in a movie after you know doing voice acting and, and appearing in the TV series uh, Green Acres before his passing, of course. But he was great in this movie. Not only that, we even have a cameo appearance by rock band ZZ Top. Yeah, where they actually played in the background during the town festival. Yeah, they, there's even that scene where, where the uh, the guitars and and the, the drums were spinning around, just like one of ZZ Top's videos that we saw. Yeah, they were a great band too. The ones with the long beards that they had. Yeah, they they, they were awesome. I mean, they even sang the soundtrack for the movie called Double Back. Yeah, perfect song too for the film. Yeah, and instead of having Huey Lewis in the news, we just get Zizzy Top. <laughs> yeah. And once again, we do hear the Alan Silvestri theme song. But the best part is when they had the Alan Silvestri theme song. I mean, they still use the, the original Back to the Future theme song, only it, it's done in a different tone. But this time they created their own Western theme towards it, so it, it works so well with the movie. Because I, I love that theme song that they chose for this movie that has that beat towards it it just feels like they're really in the west <laughs> and that same theme song was later used in the trailer of the movie Maverick in 1994 which is a remake that's based on the TV series with uh, James Gardner uh, yeah and this is the one with Mel Gibson Jodie Foster and James Gardner yeah, playing a different role this time around 
So yeah, I mean, if you saw Maverick um, and you saw the trailer, then you recognize the theme song that they used for Back to the Future Part Three. So, because that was really awesome that they did. Yeah. But the entire cast of the film were amazing. You know, once again, Marty McFly was very good in the film, as well as Christopher Lloyd, Ernestine Bergen, Leah Thompson, Thomas F. Wilson, and all the rest. <laughs> so, yeah, perfect. Especially when you got to hear um, Michael J. Fox and, and Leah Thompson and their Irish accents that they use. So they sound more different than they were. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, this was the first film to actually use the then new Universal logo, which is celebrating its 75th anniversary at the time. Yeah, which also was composed by the late great. James Horner, yeah, you couldn't forget that theme. It was very dreamy the way it was done. Yeah, because that's where you get to see the background where you saw all the original Universal logos, including the last one, which I know the last movie to use that logo was uh, Bird on the Wire. Yeah, it was also playing in theaters at this, quite almost at the same time as this film did. It was a logo that they used since 1963. And they've been using it ever since for a total of 27 years. So hard to believe. It's been the longest um, used logo ever in movies. And they, and they do use it sometimes in, in other films too, you know, as a sort of a uh, logo aberration at this point. Yeah. So that was cool. <laughs> yeah, I always remember that logo for Universal. And yes, I saw this movie in theaters um, in Glendale, California, at the Pacific Regency One Theaters, which is now the Royal Palace, as we speak. This is the same theater where I went to see Home Alone later on in that year. I saw a lot of movies over there, too, even during the 80s and 90s, before the theater got closed down in 1993 and became... A different theater until they closed it down in '94, so it was only there for for a short period of time. And it really was a good theater too. Yeah, it was owned by Pacific Theaters, they owned and operated. Even though it started out as an independent theater, and it, it was originally called the Sands Theater, since this theater was built back in sometime in the '60s, I think it has to be because it has that sort of a '60s vibe towards it when they built this theater but they upgraded it uh, sometime later in the 70s and 80s or I, I think I'm not so sure but it looks better than, than ever before but yeah that's where I saw the movie even though I did actually start falling asleep um, during the middle part of this the movie which I know I, I wish I never did fell asleep I was a little kid back then when I saw this I was five years old it was Memorial Day weekend I went out with with my father, my mother, and my brother, you know, and we we're spending out together, you know, just going out, you know, buying something, eating food, and doing all this other stuff before we went to go see the movie, because unfortunately it was a late showing, so that's where we went to go see it, and that's where I got really tired. Yeah, I got tired mostly from all that walking, so I wanted to relax, and, and I did, but nevertheless. Um, it was a really good film. I, I enjoyed the sequel even more than the second one. I mean, I love the second one too, as well as the original. Yeah. Still not as good as the original film, per se, but it, it was a perfect ending for the trilogy to go, and I'm just happy how this movie went. And I'm just so glad I finally own the entire set on DVD and Blu-ray. Since it's celebrating its 30th anniversary with the first movie, I'm pretty certain that Universal will get a new set for Blu-ray and and hopefully everything will turn out for the better. And I can't wait to see that new documentary that they're working on for Back to the Future. So that way it will always be remembered from time to time. So yeah. So anyway, that's Back to the Future Part 3. And I give that film four and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora. And I'll see you later. Bye.